Let me turn to Andrew Demeter, who is in 10th grade, attends the Notre Dame Cathedral Latin School in Chardon, Ohio. Yep. So this was not an assignment. How did you no. come across Student Cam? Well, I, at school with some of my friends, I actually create promotional videos for clubs and sports and stuff like that. So um, one of my computer teachers at the school, Mrs. Eby, she actually just forwarded me an email that she had received about the competition. And then as soon as I saw that and saw that there was prize money associated with it as well, then I kind of thought, you know, this is something I can do. And I've also had a background in filmmaking and video editing before, so I thought it was a great opportunity. And so do you think you'll continue to pursue filmmaking documentaries? Yeah, yeah probably. I'd like to go into media, communications, journalism, politics, something like that. What drew you to genetically modified foods? Well, just the fact, like I mentioned earlier, that it's such like an esoteric uh, topic and nobody really knows uh, what genetically modified organisms are. And even more disconcerting is the fact that at grocery stores, there's no type of regulation on these foods or even any type of labeling on them, which I address in the video. And it's just something so simple that you, th you think would be uh, obvious to put on a food, but it's not there. What was the hardest part of making this documentary? Definitely getting the interviews, also the editing. One of the main difficulties was gathering B-roll footage, stock footage, because when you're in Northeast Ohio and trying to film a documentary on food and wildlife in the winter, I had to purchase a lot of the stock footage I used because uh, in the cold weather and everything, it's really difficult to go outside and film all these plants and everything. And then editing and putting it all together, what was that process like? It was very, uh, it was a very long process. I had many late nights up and, and that's how I pretty much edited it. But yeah, I used a lot of stock footage music and combining all those elements together in one coherent piece was difficult but definitely rewarding. What did you learn about genetically modified food that you didn't know before? Um, that's really a tough question because I did have uh, some pretty substantial background on genetically modified organisms. But a couple things that I learned was that people aren't really willing to talk on camera on these kind of controversial matters. And also another thing, some of the people that I had tried to interview, they declined the interviews and then after they found out that I won, then they were willing to talk. So another thing is that people aren't really w willing to talk to you uh, until you're successful. So that's a life lesson that I learned. Oh, interesting. So you did win $3,000. What are you going to do with the money? Invest in Monsanto. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. Uh, I'll probably use it for uh, future video projects that I work on because a lot of the times they do involve stock footage, which is very expensive thanks to the rights of intellectual property. So I'll probably put it towards that or some sort of uh, other video project in the future. Sounds like the next topic for your documentary, intellectual property rights. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> All right, well, let's take a look at the video, We the People, Genetically Modified. We warned the FDA at the time, and this was now 20 years ago, um, that if they didn't label genetically modified foods, there would be a consumer backlash against them because consumers would wonder what they were trying to hide. Have you ever heard of a GMO or genetically modified organism? No. I think I've heard, but I'm not really sure exactly it is. It's been a long time since I've been in college for science. It's like where they add chemicals to the fruit or veggies. I know of it as a crop where they modify the genes to as like increase the yield or the taste or something else about the plant. There's been a switch in the DNA structure. You don't want to lose your seed. We require fast food restaurants to post calorie counts. So what happens in 10, 20 years down the road? To obtain a better understanding of these GMOs, I set out to interview both experts in the field of and those personally affected by genetic engineering. My first question, scientifically, how does an organism become genetically modified? A genetically modified organism or a transgenic crop is when a gene is taken from one organism and put into a different species. This typically is either a bacteria or a virus. For example, splicing the gene responsible for regulating a winter flounder's body temperature into a tomato would yield a frost-tolerant crop. Although humans have selectively bred plants forever, 
agribusinesses like Monsanto began truly genetically modifying seeds in the 1980s to both maximize farmers' crop yields and subsequently the global food supply. Monsanto is a giant. They're trying to make products that sell, but products that sell are products that people want, and people want products that are going to increase yields. Glyphosate, manufactured by Monsanto and commercially known as Roundup, is an herbicide that farmers spray on Roundup-resistant crops so the plants will grow, but the weeds will die. It's easier for these guys. They don't have to hassle. They don't have to be as accurate. Roundup takes care of it for now. By utilizing herbicides, pesticides, and advanced technologies, conventional farmers can spend less and produce more. But at what cost? The only problem I don't like about Monsanto is they come after us farmers. They have these, these patented seeds where they say, well, farmers can't use our seeds um, for a second round of crops. So you can buy the seed, you can plant it, you can harvest it, and then you've got to wipe your field clean and you've got to start new every year. That's part of the agreement the farmers sign. They go into farmers' fields and check, even though they're not supposed to. I mean, they trespass. Yeah, we know. Monsanto has filed suit against farmers who save and or replant these patented seeds so as to protect its multi-million dollar investment in genetic research and development. A group of organic farmers in New York even preemptively sued the biotech giant in fear they would be sued if patented seeds from neighboring farms contaminated their fields via wind currents. But how does this information affect the average consumer? Foods that are most often genetically modified are tomatoes, uh, corn, and soybeans, but corn and soybeans are probably the most common. According to the USDA, approximately 90% of all corn and cotton and 93% of all soybean crops planted in the United States are genetically modified. And despite suggestions of noble intent, they're genetically modifying rice to treat vitamin A deficiency throughout the world. There are people starving in Africa, and if we can get them the food that they need, I, I say why not? Both the safety and nutritional value of GMOs is inconclusive and highly disputed. There's no difference between if you ate all organic or you ate regular food. So it's not going to improve your life or health or nothing different, as long as you eat fresh. GMO salmon and farm salmon also produce only one-third of the healthy omega-3s that wild salmon have. So the nutrient value is down by almost 70 percent. Some medical professionals have proposed that the increased consumption of GMOs positively correlates with the 21st century rise in allergies, autism, infertility, and even some forms of cancer. So is it possible that some of what we're seeing is related to what we're eating? The answer is yes, absolutely. Others claim that the intimacy between agro-industry and the federal government has created a revolving door of conflicting interests at the consumer's expense. Private corporations send someone to work in government who's an expert in a certain area. That expert then allows for certain advantages that companies take advantage of and then moves back back and forth between the private sector and the public sector. For example, Michael Taylor, former vice president for public policy at Monsanto, is the current food safety czar at the FDA. But the ultimate question is, are these genetically modified organisms safe for human consumption? So you watch these commercials, you know, for, for some uh, drug on TV, and then the last 15 to 30 seconds of the spot is this long list of disclaimers warning you of all the effects and the side effects of these, of these drugs. Well, if you had to do that with a tomato, uh, chances are people wouldn't buy it. There are definitely scientists who will do a study with an end goal in mind, and they will set up the research to show whatever their agenda was at the outset. And I think there are probably people on both sides doing those kinds of things. I certainly think that there needs to be more research done. Right now, we do not have conclusive evidence to show that these products are in fact safe for consumption. This global uncertainty has prompted more than 60 countries, including all those in the European Union, to either restrict or outright ban the production and sale of GMOs. Countries around the world have said, we don't want this genetically modified food. Because neither Congress nor the FDA has yet to mandate the labeling of GM foods, despite grassroots propositions and protests, some food companies have proactively assigned a non-GMO seal 
to their products. We're going to force stringent labeling on everyone except for in the case of GMO foods. That's a problem because again, it's, it's where government has now decided that in this case, this particular area doesn't have to comply. Without transparency from our federal government, we are left in the dark. So who is responsible for determining whether or not GM foods should be labeled, banned, or simply ignored? You decide. Andrew Demeter, our 10th grade first prize high school winner for Central Division. Congratulations. Thank we you. the people genetically modified. While we were watching your documentary, Shelley Ortiz asked you a great question, and that is, tell our viewers, have you, have, doing this, has it changed the way you eat? Yeah, it actually has, but like I said, I had some prior knowledge a little bit before I made this, so I have been eating differently uh, for a little while now, but yeah, it's it's definitely changed the way I eat and how I look at things at the grocery store. I definitely find myself turning the uh, package to see uh, all the ingredients now. And what's the best, in your opinion? Yeah, we talked about this. Non-GMO non is the best. Organic simply means it's not the food isn't produced with pesticides, and then all natural means absolutely nothing. And, and is that difficult for, to, to eat that way? Is it more expensive? Yeah, it's definitely more expensive because all of the regulation that goes into it, so that's unfortunate, but ultimately people should know that if they start transitioning to this new uh, type of food, that ultimately the prices will go down. So, yeah. Wow. Andrew Demetri, thank you very much. Thank it was you. a good documentary. Congratulations.